here is what's happened since August 10th, 2020, when we adopted Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset. Bitcoin is up 65%. MicroStrategy stock and MicroStrategy's bought $3.9, almost $4 billion, not quite, but nearly $4 billion of Bitcoin. MicroStrategy stock is up 66%. So we are, we are tracking slightly ahead of Bitcoin. The S&P is up 14%. The NASDAQ is up 4%. Whoa, 4%. All of big tech is up 4%. Gold, gold is down 18%. And, you know, bonds, the ultra safe bonds, long term bonds, down 18%. Oof. So, in terms of asset classes, the crazy volatile Bitcoin is the best performing of all those major assets. Welcome back to Unscripted Crypto. Michael Saylor just shared some eye-opening insights about the financial shift since August 2020. It's truly remarkable to witness Bitcoin's meteoric rise, especially when compared to traditional stalwarts like gold in the broader stock market. But beyond the numbers, what's the real story here? How does this impact the everyday investor or someone just dipping their toes into the crypto waters? Let's unpack these revelations, delve into the broader implications, and understand how these shifts might influence our future financial strategies. So what is the lesson of that? The lesson is we're in the middle of chaos. There is no place to hide. Your choices, you could buy gold, but gold is dead metal and it's just getting ground into the dirt, right? I can seize your gold. Gold is the half-life of money and gold is 35 years. And you can't put gold on 8 billion iPhones. So the problem is there's no tech in gold and it was a good idea in the 19th century and it's centralized, governments can seize it and the gold miners keep debasing it. They keep mining more gold, right? In the best year, you get 2% more. In the worst year, someone seizes a bunch of gold, dump it on the market, you get more than 2%. So people are looking for a safe haven. What's it gonna be? Property in Africa, property in Venezuela. You can't have property in North Korea, property in Argentina. <laughs> A business? A business where? A business in Argentina where the currency collapses? What go to your cash flows if the currency that you generate the cash flows are collapses in value? So I think here's the here's the big idea. Really big idea. Everybody in the world has to decide where they're gonna locate their family. They have to physically, they have to decide where they're going to locate themselves in cyberspace, their mind. Are you going to watch Facebook all day long? Are you going to read Twitter? Are you going to be on YouTube? You know, you're going to go to Rumble. Are you going to look at Instagram? Right? Where is your mind? Right? Um, and then the third question is, where is your business? Are you going to uh, run a yoga studio in Miami? How about a yoga studio in New York? How about you know? Are you going to run a farm in Zimbabwe, a ranch in Argentina? Are you going to buy a company that has business interest in China? How about uh, owning a bunch of businesses in Ukraine or Russia, right? So where is your P&L, right? And, and, the, and the fourth big idea is where is your balance sheet? Okay, you, you, uh, you're a podcaster on YouTube. Okay, well, you better make sure that you comply with YouTube platform requirements. Otherwise, they turn off your podcast and, and, and they crimp your business. That's where you generate your revenue and you generate your cost. But now where are you going to save your money? Are you going to save it in U.S. sovereign debt? Are you going to actually store it in gold? Are you going to buy land? Where? In California? In Ukraine? In Russia? Where? In Florida? Right? Are you going to buy S&P index stocks? Are you going to buy Bitcoin? Are you going to buy art? So, there were conventional answers to all these questions. And, and they kind of worked for... You know, there was an answer to this question before 1914. There was an answer to this question between 19 uh, between Bretton Woods and 1971. There was an answer to this question from 1971 till year 2020. In 2020, it's like, oh, the answer: 60/40 bond portfolio by the S&P index and like a portfolio of diversified bonds, and you're good. Okay. There was an answer. The answer kind of got confusing after 2020. The answer got confusing for a lot of businesses, for a lot of people. 
Moving on, Michael paints a vivid picture of the current financial chaos. The age-old trust in gold seems to be waning, replaced by the allure of the digital frontier. But in this vast sea of options and the whirlwind of change, where do we anchor ourselves? The digital age isn't just about cryptocurrencies, it's about redefining our online presence, rethinking our business strategies, and re-evaluating our wealth storage options. As we sail through these turbulent waters, let's explore some guiding principles and strategies. Together, we'll navigate the complexities of this digital era, ensuring we're not only safeguarding our assets, but also capitalizing on emerging opportunities. The highlight of the year is people were stunned from March of 2020 to March of 2021. And from March of 21 through the middle of 2022, they're all starting to get their bearings. And they're, and they're like, well, I guess, what is Bitcoin, a digital commodity? Is that, do I have to deal with that? Well, now, now Fidelity's talking about rolling out the 34 million retail accounts. You've got the government embracing crypto assets, saying we better figure it out. Congress, senators getting educated on it. The CFTC, the SEC getting educated on it. You know, uh, big institutional investors starting to take uh, Bitcoin positions. You know, the media now, you know, now you've got Bloomberg covering crypto. You've got CNBC covering crypto. You, you know, you, you've got an entire world, media, analysts, politicians, financiers, and they're all starting to figure this out. But I still say we're early, right? This, this paradigm shift takes a decade. And maybe the first decade was the embers of a flame flickering from 2009 to 2020. And then from 2020, we started pouring gasoline on that flame, right? Get the gasoline in the US is we triple the inflation rate, triple it, uh, monetary inflation. But forget about that. Maybe you're a blue blood living on the Upper East Side with a trust fund and you just don't see why you need it. The gasoline in Sri Lanka is everybody lost everything overnight. The gasoline in Lebanon is the bank frozes, freezes their doors and you lose all your money. The gasoline in Argentina is the peso goes from 20 pesos to the dollar to 280 pesos to the dollar in four years. Right. The gasoline in Ukraine is is oops, there's a war. Banks are you know, there's a limit to how much money you can withdraw. And the gasoline in Russia is OK. I get, you know, you, the stuff you thought you owned in Europe, you don't own that anymore. We're taking that from you, <laughs> taking your gold, taking your bonds, taking your yachts, taking your villas. So there's a lot of people with a two by four to the head and they're all stunned and they're all trying to figure it out. And there is this um, colorful debate, a political debate, a media debate, you know, a debate on YouTube, a debate on Twitter. What's the solution? And the only thing we can all agree on is we probably need to look at some new ideas because the old ideas just don't work anymore. There's no intellectually honest person that would say, yeah, everything I believed in 2019 or 2018, it's all still true. I haven't changed any of my opinions about anything. I mean, everybody's had a place in their life where they've, you know, been... Uh, They've been jarred and stunned, and now they're trying to make sense of it. So the question is, how do we move forward? And you know, to summarize on Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin is uh, it's very volatile. It's getting uh, it's getting jerked around. All risk assets are getting jerked around. Summary of all this: it's it's this. We had an unprecedented expansion of the money supply in March of 2020, where we just pegged interest rates to zero and the bankers said we're going to keep interest rates at zero for the next four years they i mean they literally implied they said not until 2024 will we raise interest rates okay well, that's one panic and now we've got the other extreme which is the fastest tightening of the money supply like one of those oh crap moments oops i think we overdid it on one side now we overdid it on the other side and what you see is risk assets they're all getting hammered down Bitcoin included, but but look, all financial assets, bonds hammered 20%, NASDAQ hammered 30%, S&P, gold hammered, silver hammered, uh, and Bitcoin hammered. But on the other hand, tangible assets, 
oil, natural gas, food, <laughs> any type of energy, they're all shooting up. Right. And I think people are going through this moment where they're like, I guess I'm going to freeze to death or starve to death unless I have some of that tangible commodity stuff and the financial stuff. I guess I'll trade it. And meanwhile, the, the politicians, you know, they play with the little knobs uh, attempting to do good. And uh, and it turns out that it's very difficult for humanity, for any any human being to actually make ju adjustments fast enough and intricately enough so that they can do good without probably doing more harm than good. And that's where we find ourselves right now. As we wrap up, it's evident that we're navigating unprecedented financial times. From the roller coaster of interest rates to the unpredictable behavior of various assets, the only constant seems to be change. Yet amidst this financial maelstrom, Bitcoin emerges as a potential lighthouse for many. Michael's insights underscore the rising importance of tangible assets, while also highlighting the vulnerabilities of certain financial instruments. In this dynamic financial landscape, knowledge is our greatest asset. Stay curious, stay informed, and as always, keep it unscripted. Until our next exploration, take care.